So in this video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through the equations that you need to know for the CIE IGCSE physics uh, specification. So I'm going to take you through and just point out a few key things as we do. So starting off with the forces and motion topic, the first one of the first equations you'll come across is the average speed equation. Uh, so Many people know this equation as speed equals distance over time. That's not technically true, it's average speed equals distance over time. Distance would usually be in meters, time in seconds, giving you a speed in meters per second, sometimes written as meters seconds to the minus one. Those two are the same thing. Average velocity, um, very similar, but instead of distance, you've got displacement, the vector equivalent of distance on the top line. Otherwise, it's very similar. And you'll notice, confusingly, the symbol for displacement is an S and the symbol for speed is an S, which is, is not particularly helpful, um, but just something to look out for. The equation for acceleration, or actually more generally, it's actually the equation for average acceleration. It's change in velocity divided by the time taken. Uh, so that gives you a unit of meters per second squared, and you'll sometimes see this equation written as v minus u over t, where v is the final velocity and u is the initial velocity of the object. So you sometimes see it in that form. To calculate resultant force, we need Newton's second law, effectively, which says resultant force equals mass times acceleration. Um, so resultant force, I will usually write as sum of f equals ma, but this is actually comes from the expression actually resultant force is change in momentum per second. That's the more general expression of Newton's second law. So weight force, uh, we need the mass times the gravitational field strength to give us our force in Newtons, often written as W equals mg, and momentum it will be mass times by velocity, uh, so and that gives us this vector of momentum. So momentum has two commonly seen units, newton seconds, because it's a force times time, but you also see kilogram meters per second because it's mass times velocity. Both are the same thing. So density, the scalar, would be mass per unit volume. So there's two common forms you see it in. You see it in kilograms per meter cubed, and you also see it in grams per centimeter cubed as well. So you see both of those, but I've stuck with the SI units here. Tension force in a string is often known as Hooke's law. Uh, so you'll see that as F equals KX or stiffness constant times extension, uh, giving you a tension force in Newtons. Tension force being the force that resists you stretching uh, an object. So then moving on to pressure, pressure is the force divided by the area over which it's applied. So the SI unit given is called a Pascal, but it's the same as a Newton per meter squared. Uh, that gives us that equation. And then pressure at depth in the fluid still has the same unit, um, but the equation to calculate it is this one. So we do have to do the density times the gravitational field strength times the depth below the surface. Moment of a force has the unit of Newton meters. Why? Well, because it's a force times the distance, Newtons times meters. Um, the key is the distance has to be perpendicular to the force um, that in order to be, allow this equation to work. Moving on to look at energy, uh, work done measured in joules. Um, so then we're going to do, to get work done, you do force times displacement parallel to the force, so the distance moved in the direction of the force. Power is the rate at which work is done, uh, so it's work done divided by time, uh, so it has a unit of watts or joules per second. Kinetic energy, well it's an energy, so it's going to be measured in joules. We do half times mass times speed squared, and you'll notice in all of the equations so far that we've had mass, we needed to have it in kilograms. And it's something to watch out for because in chemistry you use mass in grams pretty much all the time. In physics, mass needs to be in kilograms if it's going into an equation. Change in GPE, again, is going to be measured in joules. So it'll be mass times the gravitational field strength times the change in height. So we can never say how much GPE something has at a specific point, but we can say how much GPE has changed between two points. Moving on to some efficiency, uh, which is usually expressed as a percentage, uh, but otherwise it's actually unitless. 
So there's two ways of calculating it. We can do energy, useful energy over input energy, or we can do useful power over uh, input power. Either of those two will give you an efficiency and you multiply by 100% to give you efficiency as a percentage. Thermal energy to change temperature, it's gonna be measured in joules, and we're gonna need the mass, the specific heat capacity, and the temperature change. So that's the Q equals MC delta T equation. Thermal energy to change phase or to change state, depending on the terminology you use. Again, it's gonna be in joules, and we just need Q equals ML, mass times specific latent heat. And occasionally with these last two equations, you get given specific heat capacity or specific latent heat in joules per gram instead. So just be careful with your units with questions like this. Boyle's law is often expressed in two ways, either saying pressure times volume is a constant or pressure times volume initially is equal to pressure times volume finally. The key being you can apply Boyle's law when temperature is constant. So you need to know that condition is happening and then you can apply Boyle's law in these forms. Okay, so moving on to waves, uh, we have the wave equation, which states that wave speed is frequency times by wavelength. And then moving on from that, we have refractive index, which doesn't have a unit, it's unitless. And the reason being is it's the speed divided by speed, so the units cancel out. So it's the speed of light in a vacuum divided by speed of light in a medium, speed of light in a vacuum being 3 times 10 to the 8, so that's something you should know. So moving on to Snell's law. Uh, Snell's law, I think the most useful general format of Snell's law is this one, which tells you the refractive index times the sine of the angle of incidence. So the refractive index before the boundary times the sine of the angle of incidence is equal to the refractive index after the boundary times the sine of the angle of refraction. That's that form. And at a critical angle, critical angle is the angle of incidence when the angle of refraction is 90 degrees. So sine of the angle of refraction becomes a one because sine of 90 is one. And then the angle of incidence is the critical angle. So if you know N1 and N2, you can calculate what the critical angle is. Moving on to electricity. So we have current, which is measured in amps or with the symbol A. So current is the number of charges through a point measured in coulombs divided by the time in seconds. So I equals Q over T. Resistance measured in ohms using the symbol omega is a potential difference divided by current, uh, so R equals V over I. So we already met power, but we're going to meet it in a different way in terms of electricity. So um, current is the number of charges per second. Potential difference tells you the energy transferred per charge. So if you multiply them together, you get energy per second or power. Um, so P equals IV is the common form you see it in, but you also see it in P equals I squared R, which is helpful for understanding um, how transformer losses work. And also you see P equals V squared over R as well. But it's still power, so it's still measured in watts. Moving on to look at combining resistors. Uh, if they're in series, you just add them together. Uh, if they're in parallel, we apply the reciprocal rule. And one of the things to make sure you remember is at the end of your calculation to flip everything back over. That's the step people often forget when using this equation. And if we're dealing with a transformer that is 100% efficient, what that means is the power on the primary side is equal to the power on the secondary side. So the subscript P and S stand for primary and secondary. And that gives us this relationship. So IPVP is equal to IS. Yes, so primary current times primary voltage is equal to secondary current times secondary voltage. With a transformer, you also see this, that the turns ratio, so NS over MP, is equal to the voltage ratio, VS over VP as well. Finally, looking at radiation, we have a couple of general equations for this. So with alpha decay, the nuclear number should decrease by four, and the proton number should decrease by two and you emit a helium nucleus. Beta decay, the nuclear number should change. The proton number should increase by one because a neutron has turned into a proton. So that's why that's gone up. And you should emit a high speed electron as well. And that concludes the equations that you need to know for the CIE IGCSE specification.